you doing, folks? Welcome to part 12 of my refight of Brandywine using GMT's Battles of the American Revolution. Having a lot of fun playing this game series, and I hope you guys are too. Uh, we're in the second half of the seventh turn, turn seven, and the British are up. This is when Howe arrives in force uh, from the north. Uh, in addition, I'm going to try and add a little bit more detail for you guys, particularly where the combats are very important, where they're critical, show you some of the modifiers and how they work, especially when fighting across the Brandywine Creek or how the diversion tactic works in the rules. So let's jump into this and, and see what happens as how arrives in the battlefield. Currently, we are in the bottom half of turn seven. It is the British player's turn. Uh, the Americans, the Patriots, went first. And you guessed it, this is the turn that Howe and his forces arrive in force. And that'll be up in that direction up there. You'll see them come on. And again, the British are up first, and they're going to do some moving. Now, here's what I'm anticipating this turn. Now, if we look down here on the western side of the Brandywine, where the British are located, they've just managed to... Uh, Force the Americans back. They are now on the east side of the Brandywine, where they started. Uh, if you remember, Green did come across uh, with an ill-fated uh, counterattack in this position here, which failed. And he's since retreated back on the other side of the Brandywine. So the British are now in a position to reorganize themselves and reinforce Grant, who uh, is currently holding the Ford here, Chad's Ford. He's been fighting a uh, little prolonged fight with Green here. And he's doing pretty well for himself. So he's holding the Ford. Now there is a second primary Ford. And it's right here at Chad's Ferry. Where the rebels, basically the bulk of Green's force, withdrew across. And this counter, by the way, is a marker. To remind me, there's a combination of disrupted and parade order units in that stack. Uh, so yeah, that's the situation. I think we're going to see a lot going on here with Inifhausen's force and Grant. Uh, I'm going to reinforce Grant's position, his hold on the fort up there, uh, with some of these fresher units. I am going to pull back some of the reduced strength units, units that are relatively worn in the fighting, like the 49th, I believe this is. They are reduced. They were flipped from their starting side. They took some damage earlier. They're gonna pull them back. I don't wanna jeopardize them and take any more losses with them. And we'll get some fresh units up front supporting Grant. I think Nifhausen is going to move up in this direction uh, to make a attack on Chad's Ferry, the second primary Ford. And at the same time, I wanna reinforce Grant, give him some extra forces. So, uh, that's pretty much what we're going to do. And we're going to line up our secondary forces here as well to kind of be a reserve to support them. So once a crossing is made, we will do so. Uh, let me know artillery fire for the British this turn. Um, but the Patriots will be able to fire during uh, the British turn defensive fire, as it's known. If we look slightly to the left of Goodenhausen's um, position over here. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do, if anything, over on this side of the battlefield. Uh, there's really nothing essential to gain control of. There is a primary Ford here. There's a couple secondary Fords here. They may or may not be useful in the, the fight later on down the road in the later turns. We'll see. But I do have Gray here, who has two units. Uh, they were uh, disrupted earlier, but they're back in shape and ready to move forward. No artillery support. I could move forward and once again attack this position at Britain's Ford. Uh, I'm not sure I'll do that. I do have some cavalry over here, some dragoons that are currently kind of trapped over there, although it's not a bad thing. Uh, they're doing a little reconnoiter reconnoitering for me. Uh, this marker will come off during this turn's rally phase. And let me back in top shape again. It's a cavalry withdrawal. They fought a combat up here with these guys earlier. So I don't know. Maybe a little distraction going on here with Gray. I don't know. Uh, but we'll see. I'll think about that. 
And of course, we have up here, more to the north, the Brandywine. We have Sterling and his Patriots holding a good position there. They're kind of engaging my initial light troops, which are preceding Howe's advance and arrival onto the battlefield at this location, D. Uh, as I showed in the last episode, uh, Howe's force what it was made up of. They will be coming on from this hex. They'll begin movement from here. And they'll be moving down these slopes and fanning out. I think what we're going to see here is I'm going to focus more on the left uh, side of Howe's position over here, the left side of the road. And we're going to focus our attention at slipping through this area. Uh, there's not a whole lot opposing me. Uh, Sterling has the bulk of his forces lined up on this hill over at the Birmingham Meeting House and right here along this road. Uh, there's not as much in this direction, so I'm anticipating he's going to put up a strong defense at the road in the Birmingham Heights, supported by uh, the Birmingham Meeting House, supported by the troops on the Birmingham Hill. Uh, he does have some batteries of artillery, which will be in range to anybody moving up this road, at least from this point. Uh, we'll put some forces up here, I imagine. Uh, not that I'm going to launch any attacks from here, but we're going to push up the road as best we can, and we're also going to push up on the left side of the road in this direction. Uh, and we'll try and hit the house from two directions, from the road and from this side, which would be the east side. And hopefully we can keep pushing forward with some of our troops, uh, even in this direction, if we can get up these slopes where these guns are, or even bypass them, and get up to this position here on the road. If we can do that, uh, it's just a march down to Dith Worthington, uh, Dill Worthington, which is the objective that we have to get. Let me show you that. There it is with that red star, currently occupied by some cavalry here, Pulaski actually. So that's the plan for deployment of Howe's forces. When they arrive, you're going to see them guys come on and we'll see what it looks like when I'm all done. And also I'm going to go through the rallies of which there is at least one unit to rally. That'll uh, boost my, my army's morale, but my it's already maxed, so it's not going to make a difference. And let's see what's under here. Uh, yeah, that would be useful. That's a relatively full-strength unit. It hasn't been reduced, so that'll be useful. So all in all, it's the British are in a really good shape at this point in the battle. And of course, looking at the army morale, all important in this fight. Uh, the Patriots are at 8. That is not good. They're 3 away from wavering. And folks, this is this might play a bigger role in the battle than I originally anticipated. Uh, this stretch between these uh, army morale markers is considerable. Uh, the only way the Americans can get up on this scale here, really, is to be successful in combat. Do some, get aggressive, fight some battles, win, capture enemy units, eliminate enemy units. It's the only way this is going to go up. Got to motivate that army to keep them going. Right now, it's looking grim. Morale in the Patriot uh, ranks is not high. That's what this represents. And yeah, this could bring a sudden end to the entire battle. It might not even make it 12 turns if this keeps dropping dramatically. And I have to admit, uh, the British uh, have been rolling really good throughout this uh, this uh, battle. Uh, in the last turn, I think, the Americans, they it was horrible dice rolling on their part. Uh, although they did manage up there with Sterling to capture some uh, Germans, some Jaegers, which helped the morale slightly, but it went right back down after some other losses. So that's the situation. I'm going to jump into this, get the British moving forward over here, and bring on Howe's forces and show you guys what it looks like. And I'll also do the rallies as well. And, well, let's, let's see what it looks like when I'm done here. All right, so movement is complete. So is the rallies. Uh, start down here and take a look. You can see some of the forces that I shifted here. Uh, once again, not as effective as I thought it would be. All these artillery and the infantry supporting them have shifted over to the right. A single hex. Moved up some of the Germans. Uh, reinforced Grant's position. Remember, he has two regiments with him. I believe it's strength six. That could be wrong. I think it's six. I hope it is. And supported on him on the left. 
with the 44th and the King's Own over here on the right in the woods. I was not able to get to Chad's Ferry. That really threw me off. I was hoping to get there much quicker than that. So that's unfortunate. Uh, and I moved up some of these units. I held back some of the reduced strength units like this one, this Queen's Rangers. Although the Tory artillery is coming up behind Neufhausen to support him. Uh, and again, these Germans are commanded by Stern. Uh, he can't uh, use any of his abilities if he's stacked with any British or Tory units. He has to be with, uh, to be effective anyway, he has to be with Germans only. That's the only limitation of, of him. Uh, it's mainly due to the language barrier, among other things. But yeah, there is this as far as this concerns. So there's going to be some fighting up here along the creek. So we'll get into that in a minute. It's also worth having a look at Gray here. His two regiments. He has not moved. Now, I wasn't sure what I was going to do with him exactly. So had a little fun. Odds he would move to engage this position again. Evens, he would hold his ground. And it came up a two. So he held his ground. I didn't do anything with him. Uh, so there he is. He's kind of functioning as a just-in-case force, uh, in case the Patriots actually come across. want to cause a little havoc. But there's no efforts to take these secondary fords or this primary ford from the Patriots' control at this point. I don't see a value in it at this point. That could change as we get into the battle. We shall see. And I do have to take this off. So these cavalry are ready to go. I did not move them yet. Uh, I'm probably going to shift them up back in this direction, maybe skirt into the woods. We'll see, but I don't anticipate putting them into any combat. If I do, I'll show you guys. So that's movement over here. Of course, we got to show Howe's arrival. You'll notice here, I, I basically put everything on the board in one go. Uh, and there they are. Uh, got my first fire marker on these Jaegers up here, rifle armed. And I couldn't use any strategic movement. Uh, again, the Patriots' tactic of engaging quickly and moving down that road is kind of beneficial to them. The only place I could use strategic movement is along this road, so I couldn't go far. I proceeded the advance with more light infantry. There was more light infantry units than I thought there was. I think there's three or four of them in there. Uh, far fewer line regiments. But basically... Um, give you a gist of how this is going on here. I've got the Germans shifting to the right flank. And let me back up a little bit. Just to give you guys some context, uh, the Germans are basically going to be holding the right flank of Howe's uh, forces entering the battlefield. The center, you're going to see mostly line infantry, uh, as well as the light infantry, and some grenadiers bringing up the rear. Their whole objective is to move forward along the road and assault this position, the Birmingham Meeting House. The Germans are holding the right flank, and they'll probably be deployed in two lines. You'll have the grenadiers on the right and in the rear, preceded by the Jaegers and the more, uh, I, if there is line units in here. I've seen a lot of German grenadiers, and that's pretty much what's going to be over here. If anything, they will be a backup reserve to assault the heights, or more likely to be thrown towards the middle at the Birmingham Meeting House later in the battle. However, this little force here, remember I was talking about this, this force here is important. Uh, they'll make the crossing here at the run, they'll hopefully drive these Patriots back, and uh, this force on the left is predominantly made up of, let's see, I've got a couple Grenadier units. Uh, I believe I have the Coldstream Guards as well which are a plus two unit, that's them right there. Uh, they will be leading this assault on the left flank of the British uh, to hopefully drive these units back, uh, hit the meeting house from this side, which is the east side, and push onto this road area back here. That's their main goal. I don't want them guys to be slowed down. They do have some light infantry with them as well. Uh... Yeah, that is the goal. Of most value to me here is the keeping these guys in parade order as they advance on Dworth and the town, which is the objective. I need to take that. So there is that. And they are also supported by some Jaegers here. And I'll probably put Howe in command of this attack on the left and leave Cornwallis. 
with the reserve and the assault on Birmingham House. There'll be plenty of troops to uh, secure Birmingham Meeting House if the game goes the distance, which I don't know if it will or not, to be honest with you. Uh, Patriots have to be successful in combats. It's the only way. And Emisets are up here with the Chasseurs. They will be with the contingent of other Germans on this side here. Kind of a reserve. Uh, yeah. So we'll see how this goes. This is the deployment. This is the force and how they will be going in and what you guys can expect. Hopefully we can drive back in the combat uh, these enemy cavalry. And by the way, I, I wasn't really paying big attention to lining up my close combats as much as I probably should have. Uh, the British are winning by far at this point so i'm getting a little bit slack with them and i ended up just moving adjacent here with two cavalry units two horse units uh against a sizable patriot infantry unit and a very small cavalry unit so um, uh, this could turn bad for me as the attacker and also this little location here they're all alone this uh rifle armed unit of Jaegers all by themselves, and I don't know why these units are turned that way. You can see them. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can see. But uh, yeah, these guys are all along going against this strong unit of Patriots. So uh, I was thinking I could reinforce them quickly. I could not. I could not uh, get anything for, far forward in this case. Forward enough. And something I do have to show you here. Right down here. I know this is the Patriots, uh, but the Delaware Blues, and Congress's own, remember these guys came on from down in the, the Dungeon Bottom area, and I was debating whether I was going to head them up to the support Sterling, or if I was going to head more to the, the south and support uh, the main, uh, basically Sullivan's original location along the Brandywine. And I had chose to move them up here. I forgot to show that in the last video. So they're well on their way up to help Sterling. And that's a strength 4 plus 2 and a strength 1, 0. So not much going there. But it's 5 strength points on their way to help Sterling. We'll see if that helps. So there is that. Right, let's take a look at uh, Grant's force here. Um... Uh, now, there's only the one Ford is located right here where Grant is. Uh, so there's going to be a combat here between Grant and Green. Uh, now, combat is not mandatory for the attacker across a non Ford hex side, which that's this case here and this case here as well. But if I do choose to attack across, which I can, it's, it's an option to do so. If I do so, uh, other units will also have to that are adjacent to the defender and attacker, uh, like, which is not going to really count here. Um, so I'm going to think about this, whether or not I want to engage across the Brandywine to either help Grant. He's got two units. Uh, there's him, him attacking this stack, for instance, would be optional, simply because there's no Ford hex here. It is completely across uh, the, the Brandywine. Now this combat across the Ford does have to take place, but remember there's two units in here. I could, if I want, attack both green and optionally have a second regiment attack here. But if I do that, that means this unit, which is adjacent to him, also has to attack. And yeah, that's how I'm understanding the rules anyway. But uh, I'm going to think about this, and I'll show you guys the results of it. But needless to say, uh, there's decent numbers of troops for the British here. It looks pretty positive to me. We'll see. I'll look at the factors for attacking across the Brandywine, non-Ford, Hexides, and such. Uh, Green doesn't have a whole lot of good quality troops here. And that unit is disrupted. So we'll see how this goes. And this is pretty much the only close combat to look at uh, outside of up to the north where Sterling was that I just showed. Uh, as far as defensive artillery goes, which actually is next, uh, there will be some fire by the Patriots. They do have some guns in range, including at this position here, Proctor's Battery. Uh, there is some 
And this unit won't be a target because both these hexes block units block line of sight. Uh, can't see this unit because of that. And these two units are on higher ground, and he's upslope as well. So upslope units can see one another. Uh, so they can ignore this terrain and units and see either of these targets. So this battery could fire amongst these two targets. Uh, can't fire at Grant's position because of green in the way. Grant is not on an upslope position. Uh, yeah, so there's not a whole lot of targets, but there will be some defensive fire from the British, or from the Patriots, sorry. And as far as any other guns, let's see what we got here. Nothing there. I don't think in here. No. How about rifle units? Kind of catching the Patriots still. This, those are some pretty beat up units there. There's rifles here. No rifles for the British. I did move Ferguson's up a little bit to kind of support Gniffhausen. And yeah, that's really it. So there'll be some rifle fire here. There'll be some defensive artillery from the Americans on these positions. And that's about it outside of Sterling's, which I showed earlier, which does have a Jaeger unit adjacent to some Americans and uh, one other combat to fight. So let's show the results of the artillery and rifle fire. All right, so I resolved that. Uh, the net result was uh, Patriot defensive fire with the artillery was ineffective. I fired pretty much like a anticipated. I did do some counter battery fire in the strong strength three artillery battery uh, with the Patriot units here and believe it or not missed it and most of the results I got were like one point under a hit what I needed to score a hit. So there was nothing here. Um, rifle fire. I did use these rifles here Doyle's to take a shot in this stack and try and maybe get lucky and take Grant out of the battle but uh, no, they didn't get a hit so Nothing here. And up here at Sterling's area, pretty much the same thing. Only the Germans had a rifle unit. That was this unit of Jaegers. Uh, they took a shot at this unit, and they were also ineffective. And I believe that was it. There was no more rifles. Again, rifle range is adjacent. Uh, Amy said to have a range of two against other cannon. And artillery typically have a range maximum of three. So... That was the rifle shooting and defensive artillery fire for the Patriots. Oh, and one other thing is there was no artillery here capable of hitting any of the targets down here also. So there was none of that going on. And while we're up here talking about close combat, what's going to happen? Uh, again, as the British players turn, uh, this rifle unit does not have to attack because it's rifle armed. These Jaegers can sit back. They don't have to attack this unit, even though they're adjacent. They don't have to. So, and I don't think I will. I'm happy to just sit here. So this combat won't happen. Up here is a different story. Uh, I have two horse units, and I'm adjacent to two enemy units, which have to be attacked. Uh, and... Let's see, I think I would be able... Somebody has to attack this other cavalry unit, which means they're going to be locked in combat. There's not going to be any withdrawal. The defender won't be able to withdraw. And somebody has to attack him. Uh, but also, somebody has to attack here as well. So I'm going to have to split these units up to attack uh, these guys here. Uh, there is a diversion tactic you can use. I'm not sure that is available. Like, I'd love to divert this. And not have to attack it and put both of my attacks on this horse unit of the Patriots. But I'm going to take a left hand column shift, <clears throat> which favors the Patriots. And that's basically the diversion rule. And it basically allows you to ignore a stack of units in order to attack somewhere else. But you take a penalty. Uh, I'm going to think about this as well. I think that would be a good tactic to use since I pretty much have to stay here. I can't. Uh, leave the combat. Uh, I guess I could withdraw with one of these cavalry units that was fighting against him. And because I'm all cavalry, I could withdraw. Well, now I take that back because I'm the attacker. I can't do that. So forget that. There's no cavalry withdrawal for the British units. 
they have to split their attacks here. And I'll probably use a diversion. I'll reread the rule to see if I can pull it off on this so I don't have to fight against the infantry uh, and have both units attack these cavalry. And hey, we probably are going to get pretty lucky because it seems to be favoring us, at least in the cavalry department. Uh, we'll see what happens. So yeah, that's the close combats up here with Sterling. All right, looking down here, uh, Nifalsen's force, here's what's going to happen. British players turn, they're going to do their attacks here. So, Grant obviously has to attack, and that will be against Green right there. I am not going to attack across this non-Ford hex side against these uh, Doyle's position, the Patriots on the other side. To do so would uh, cause some problems that I don't want to deal with. But we are going to attack green across the primary ford. I believe this is how this is done. So I'm only going to be attacking him. Attacking him is an option. I'm not going to do that. Uh, because this is a primary ford, I have to attack him. Uh, this unit will support Grant. So he is going to attack across the Brandywine Creek, not a ford hex side, to attack green. That's going to give Grant some uh, strength points of three added to this. Uh, so I think that will be beneficial to me in the modifiers department. I could be wrong, but you know what? We're going to keep this decision, which I love to do when I'm playing solo. I like to think through these things and, and, and make the decision and then accept it, go to the die rolls, make the mistakes where they happen and see what happens. It's fun that way. But this guy will stay out of the fight. Because I believe if he did attack this guy, for instance, that brings this stack into the combat. And although they'll be penalized, it's there's more strength points here. So I'm, I'm not going to deal with that. Um, so yeah, these two units will launch an attack on Green's position. So there is that close combat to resolve. Okay, let's show you guys the results of those combats. All right, jumping up to Sterling's position. Okay, I'm going to show you guys this combat. But uh, here's the situation. This one isn't going to take place because the Jaegers are not going to engage. They're not going to attack. Again, it's an option. But uh, these two up here, and as I described the situation before, I'm going to use a diversion. And basically what that means is that I can ignore one of the units that I'm adjacent to in the combat. I don't have to attack them. And that's going to be this unit. It's actually a stack so all the units in that hex don't have to be attacked. Because uh, otherwise, this could be a disaster for the British. So we're going to do a diversion against the 7th Virginia, which is strength 5. So I don't have to fight him. However, I do have to attack whoever's adjacent. And that would be this unit here. Uh, can't see that name. But both of these units will be able to do so. So I can concentrate my cavalry strength here against his lone unit of horse. So that's going to be the odds. It's going to basically be two to one. Now the penalty for this is that I have to shift one uh, column to the left in favor of the Patriots. And if we look at our sheet here, you'll see where we're looking. Our two to one odds are going to drop to three to two. So slightly uh, less of an advantage than we would have had. But I think that would be worth doing in this case because otherwise we got this strength five unit of infantry to deal with. So we'll take that penalty, do the diversion, and fight this combat. It's going to be three to two odds and we're going to tally up the, well, the lead units here. Uh, I'm going to take the plus one as the lead unit in this case. So the British Dragoons will be the lead unit. And then we're going to tally up the modifiers and see what we come up with. Looking at the modifiers, this is the total. I'll run through these. Uh, the plus two basically comes from, uh, uh, what was that? The net morale of my chosen lead unit. In this case, I chose the plus one morale unit, but he also gets a plus one for his army morale level, which is high. Remember, they get a plus one on top of this uh, value that's on the counter. So they're, they're actually at a plus two. So we have the plus two for my morale, my lead unit. Uh, I also get a plus one because of the morale of the Patriot 
lead unit. There's only one unit here, so this automatically is the lead unit. They're at zero, and they have a penalty of negative one to the unit's printed morale, which is zero, so it becomes minus one. Red in reverse, in this case, which gives me an additional plus one in this case, because the morale is so hard in the Patriot forces so far. They are in the fatigue zone. Uh, so the zero becomes a negative one. Red in reverse, plus one. So now we're at plus three. And finally, attacking across a run, all the units are attacking across a run, negative one penalty. So it's going to be a total of plus two to my die roll, or the combat die roll, in this combat. So let's make that roll. Here we go. So we're going to get a plus two to this roll. We want high numbers. And by the way, we are under the three to two odds. Remember, we had to shift one column to the left in favor of the Patriots. Otherwise, it would have been two to one odds. And we get an eight. That is a nice roll. Plus two is ten. Let's check out the chart. All right, looking at this, we're going to cross-reference the result of 10 under the 3 to 2 column. And one thing you'll notice right away is there's a red dot by the 10. That means momentum has been gained. The British player will gain a momentum chip for this combat. Now, as far as the results are concerned, remember, we're under the 3 to 2. And for the 10 row, we have a dash for the attackers, no effect on the British units. And there is a 1... Uh, for the Patriots, the Patriots will suffer a one step loss. That means, in this case, the cavalry unit is reduced. It's flipped to its other side, which is blank, and that means it's eliminated. It has been removed from the battle. That's going to affect the morale of the Patriot army, as well as the British, as we'll see in a second here. But also, you notice there's an asterisk by that one result. That means if there is an officer present... Uh, on the uh, Patriots' side, there's a chance he could uh, become a casualty or eliminated, captured, and so on and all that stuff. And that's not the case in, in this situation. But there it is. The Patriot unit will be removed, and the British units will advance into the hex. All right, in terms of effects of that combat, uh, the Patriot morale, which was 8, is now dropped down to 7, uh, for losing that unit. In addition, theirs goes up by plus one, but it's already at 21, so that's that. In addition, the British gain one victory point, which, yeah, once again, takes it up to 14. So that's the result of that combat. Quite a, a lucky go, actually, for the, for the British. They had that opportunity. That diversion paid off for the cavalry. Otherwise, that could have been a disaster. So next up, we're going to go down here to Niffhausen's force, and we're going to resolve some of his fighting. We know what's going on down here, and I'm going to show you guys the result of all this fighting across the Brandywine. Let's jump into that. All right, so here we go into the fighting. Uh, the total odds here is nine strength points for the British going against three for the Patriots. He only has strength three for his unit there under green, and... That is it. So that converts to 3 to 1 odds in favor of the British. Now, also, my lead units are chosen here. I'm going to take this one, the 55th, which is on the top here, is a plus 1. And he has no choice. He has to take his only unit that's in here, the Patriots, which is the 2nd Pennsylvania Brigade. It is a negative 1. So that will be the lead unit for the defenders. Okay, let's tally up our modifiers and see what we come up with. Okay, let's look at the modifiers. Hopefully I got my math right here. Uh, for this combat die roll, again, the British are the attacker. They're getting a plus two for their leadership of the main, their, their lead unit. Uh, they're also going to gain a plus two for the opponent's uh, lead unit's morale. And the reason why this is plus two is because they're already a negative one. And remember, their army morale modifies that printed value by another minus one. So it's a total of minus two for that unit. Red in reverse, which you do in this case during combats, it becomes an additional plus two. This is nasty. Uh, finally, attacking across a non-Ford, in this case, the minus one applies. Uh, and a minus one for green, green's uh, combat leadership 
is a one. So this will be a penalty to the roll. And again, the British want positive numbers. So it's going to be a plus four, minus two, total of plus two under the three to one. So let's roll the dice. They get a plus two. And I should point out that the tactics played no role. Uh, I think it was refuse flank against the Patriots stand fast, which is a zero modifier. So let's see here. The British are the attacker. We're going to use the red dice. They get a plus two under the three to one odds. Here we go. Nine. Oh, boy. See what I mean about the dice rolls? The British are just hot, and the Patriots are miserably cold. So nine plus two is 12. That's going to be an additional momentum gained. Uh, can't go higher than the 11 result. And that's going to be under, let's see here, sorry about that. Uh, three to one odds. We're going to be all the way down here, if that'll focus. So no effect on the attacker. So uh, Grant, I believe, he's not going to have any effect on his troops, at least any effect that's represented in the game. Uh, but the Brit uh, Patriots are going to suffer an attacker, or no, unit captured attacker's choice. So the British will be able to choose which unit is captured from those that are actually fighting currently. And what we do here is, this was the unit that was under here green and attacker's choice it chooses the unit it's the only unit it was this one already on its reduced side so this unit will be placed in the captured units area so that's going to have a negative effect on the morale of the patriot army once again just just horrible i don't know what to say all right folks let's show that result on the army morale table jump back over here uh, this was at 7. It's now at 6. So here we go, folks. The Patriots are about to dip into the wavering zone in the Army morale table. Um, there's also one up 1, but it's already maxed at 21 for the capture. In addition, the British gain an additional victory point. They're currently at 15 to 2.5 for the Patriots. So it's not looking good for the Patriots. Like I said, the battle could end because of this. And that would be a substantial victory for the British. They're just taking too many losses and they're just not pulling it off. Uh, even though they're still holding those two objectives to secure a decisive win, and the British are nowhere near getting their objectives for a decisive win, it's still favoring the British just simply because they're winning in the melees, they're winning in the close combats, in the shooting, they're capturing, they're eliminating units, leaders, and that whole thing. Uh, Patriots have not been successful in the actual fighting itself, even though their strategy may or may not be sound. Uh, yeah, that's the situation with that. So, now we got to go back to this combat and finish it up. Now, at this point, you'll notice that green is alone in this hex. It did not retreat. It was captured. Uh, if it had retreated, he would have been able to retreat with that unit. That's not the case. Uh, after all this is calculated, what happens next is uh, the British, the ones involved in a combat, starting with the lead unit, can advance into this hex. And I believe that unit was right here. The 55th, this was the lead unit. They will advance into the hex. And unfortunately, when that happens, you guessed it, Green is captured. He's alone in the hex. An enemy have moved or advanced into that hex. He is captured. And any other units fighting in the combat can also move into that hex, including this unit. Even though he's not at the ford, this creek does not prevent him from advancing. Uh, he's able to move in there as well. And you know what? I think I want to do that. Uh, maybe not, actually. I don't want to overstack here. Six is the max. So we're going to follow up with this unit here, the 15th foot. They will follow up. Now, of course, there's units all around me at this point. Uh, and Grant also will follow into that hex. So there's six strength in there. There's units all around me here with the creek at my rear, but I do control the ford. Uh, although, yeah, 
Patriots, I'm not, no, actually they couldn't. But yeah, we'll get into that when we get to it. But yes, Green has been captured as well. And what does that mean? Well, let's take a look. I don't think I've ever showed this table off, at least outside of the introduction to the rules system, which I did, a separate video. Uh, first of all, let's look at the leader summary. We look at all these leaders here. Here we have Green. Uh, there's his victory points value, one. That's going to grant uh, the opposing side one victory point. Uh, in addition, there is an army morale adjustment for losing him. In this case, a plus two uh, for the British and a minus two for the Patriots. So that's the effect on that. This is devastating because that will effectively drop the Patriot morale to four, which is in the wavering zone. And no momentum loss. Of course, if we look over here on this side, leader impacts on victory points and army morale. See the leader summary. So that's what we just looked at. So yeah, this is how it will affect the the situation. The army morale, uh, Patriots will drop two, and the British will go up two. They're already at twenty one, but this will drop the Patriot morale down from six to four. And in addition, the British will gain that extra victory point. They'll go from fifteen to sixteen. And there we have it, folks. That is part uh, 12. This is part 12, I believe. Yes, it is. Part 12 to the series. I'm going to call it quits there. I hope you enjoyed that. I went a little bit extra there, showing the detail of the combats. They were pretty important combats. Uh, as you can see here, Grant has forced his way across Chad's Ford. He's actually on the opposite side. He's got relatively decent support, although there is an opening here behind him uh we'll see what happens with that but green has been taken out and the morale impact is definitely felt as you can see over there to the left there they are four more losses let's see dun, 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 dun. and that is it the patriot army will have to withdraw and i think that is the way it's gone. And you know what? It's actually unfortunate because it's just getting underway. And yeah, that's the situation, folks. Uh, the next episode, we're going to get into how uh, committing his forces from this direction up here. As you can see, they're all in place to do what I intended them to do. I don't know if that's going to come to fruition if the Patriots decide to up and leave the battlefield. But we're going to push forward and... Everything is going good here, and I gotta give my hats off to Gniffhausen and Grant for being relatively successful down here against the Patriots. They held their own, they didn't get confused or muddled, uh, they withstood and held off Green's counterattack across the Brandywine, uh, kept their composure, and when uh, Green fell back across uh, the Brandywine, they quickly counterattacked. They're not counterattack, but they launched their attack as planned from the very beginning. Um, there they are. So that's that, folks. It seems to be going the way of the British. But it's not over. If the Americans can get some success in these battles, raise up their army morale, and get out of this penalty zone, because right now all their units, all their morale ratings, are going to suffer a negative two to whatever's printed on that counter. That's pretty bad. On top of that, uh, their initiative rolls are going to be negative one. In fact, we're going to do that initiative uh, next since we just finished the British turn. So that's it. We're ready to go into turn eight. All right, so let's make this roll. Now, uh, of course, the British just gained two additional momentum this turn. They can give up one and use it for a plus two to the initiative roll. Uh, they don't otherwise have a modifier to that. Oh, yes, they do. They have a plus one for being high morale. They'll have a plus three. Now, of course, the Patriots at this point are negative two, I believe, to their initiative. Yes, negative two. Uh, no, sorry, wavering is negative one. Uh, yeah, so, you know what? I'm not going to use any momentum for that. We're going to save that. Maybe we can change some combat results. <laughs> So the British are going to get a plus one to the morale. And 
minus one for the Patriots. We'll see. And Patriots get an eight. Minus one is seven. Seven plus one is eight. How do you like that? So it looks like the British are going to get initiative. Uh, let me double check this. Yeah, they get a plus one for being in high morale. So that's eight. And they get a minus one for being wavering. That's a seven. So, yeah, so it's all good. So the British are going to have initiative going into turn eight of the battle. They go first, folks. And you look at the battlefield to see what's going on. Uh, as far as reinforcements, they're not going to get much. I think they get some dragoons. The Patriots will be getting some militia, some artillery. Not much. And I believe they come on on... Let's see, the Patriots are actually coming on up here, point E, right there. They'll be coming on. They got two units, a battery and some militia, not much. And the British will be getting some troops up on point D, which is where Howe came on. And they get a unit of cavalry, a unit of dragoons, I should say. So not much in terms of uh, reinforcements. But uh, with initiative, I think that's good for the British at this point. We can do like I was planning here, uh, reinforce Grant, push forward like we did, support him better, because right now he is kind of sticking out alone on that side. Uh, I might even cross the Brandywine entirely. I could take this unit and just put him on the other side. It takes all their movement to do that, of course. Uh, you can't leave a zone of control and enter an enemy zone of control to do that, which I wouldn't be doing, because I'm not starting off in the zone of control of an enemy. So I could actually do that. And I might actually support him and actually start coming across that way. We shall see. I'll think about that. If I got the rules right on that. I think I did. But definitely, if Housen is going to be moving up to Chad's Ferry and uh, get into this position to finish off these disrupted units. There's a disrupted unit in there yet. Uh, he hasn't had a chance to move away, which he is pretty much mandatory. Uh, so far, he's not able to do so. Again, unless I'm reading that rule correct, wrong, uh, wrong here. Uh, first chance he gets, that disrupted unit has to move. Uh, it's one hex out of there. But I'll look all that up when I get to it. Uh, so yeah, we're just going to keep pushing forward here. And moving on Chad's, uh, not Chad's, uh, Proctor's battery. So that's what's going on there. And of course, pushing up here with the British... Uh, how's going to come across uh, the Radley Run here? Get his troops finally across that thing. Start engaging this units and pushing them back. I really want to push up this road and get this force on my left, the British left, engaged with the enemy. I really want to push up this way as quickly as possible and get to that road up here eventually. Uh, although I have to deal with some guns, which don't seem to be defended at the moment. That's not good for the Patriots. I don't know, folks. Oh, this is a challenge for the Patriots. I don't know. Maybe I've been overly aggressive. I don't know. Uh, let me know what you guys think in the, in the comments below for sure. But I will say one thing. It's really fun. It's been a blast trying out some of these alternative uh, tactics or strategies, rather, uh, regarding the Battle of Brandywine. It's a blast. And yeah, we're just going to keep pushing up, get the Germans on the right, get uh, Cornwallis up that road and assaulting the Birmingham Meeting House. I don't think we'll get there yet. We do have to deal with these troops. Uh, yeah, so there's not a whole lot going to happen in turn eight, I don't think. And I'll be getting some more Dragoons here. Another unit, this one right here, the second Light Dragoons. Queen's Light Dragoons. Where are they? There they are. So this unit will be joining the fray. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, turn 8 is coming up, and that will be episode 12 to this battle so far. Uh, the Patriots are up against the wall. We'll see what happens. if They have to turn things around now. And I don't know if committing Washington either here or there going to make much difference at this point in the battle. Uh, all right. I hope you enjoyed, folks. Like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Hope you enjoyed. Leave me some comments and feedback. Uh, do you want to see more of these videos? Let me know. It's great fun. GMT's Great Battles of the American Revolution. 
and highly recommended so far. And I'll see you guys soon. Hang in there. It's only going to get better, folks. Take care.